Father God, we thank you so much for the fact that we know the anchor holds despite the storm. No matter what we might be going through, no matter what we might be experiencing, Father, we know that we can anchor ourselves in you and the anchor will hold. Bless us to stay. Give us the things we came here to receive. And when we leave this place, let us leave saying it was good to have been in the house of the Lord. And if there's any honor, any glory, any praise, let it go to you, for you're the only one worthy. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Another quick, two quick announcements. Next week, Elder William Thomas will have a card, a uh, large card for the pastor. If you would like to, uh, if you'd like to uh, sign the card, it'll be available next week. And also, if you would like to participate in the trip to DC, please let make sure our treasurer Kelly, uh, Kelly uh, knows so that we can begin to compile a list. It's been a minute since I've been up here. I want to say I had a sermon all together yesterday and got home and I can't say it was the Holy Spirit. It was my wife. <laughs> she said, tomorrow is Easter. You can't preach that. And so last night I got up and had to switch my sermon. So today we're doing a different sermon entitled, this is my Easter sermon, The Man of Sorrows. And uh, I want to thank the Lord. You know, my wife was right. You do need to preach to the season. I also want to say one other thing. I, I, was, I had my knee operated on on February 15th, and I had not been in class since then. And uh, this week was the first week I was back in class. And I have to say, when I walked in, they stood up and cheered. <laughs> I guess y'all ain't quite that excited about seeing it. <laughs> All right, this morning we're going to talk about, uh, with Easter coming up, I just want to remind people of Christ's sacrifice, as William did a great job this morning with the children's story, but I, I, we do need to be reminded that what this is all about is Christ's sacrifice. And so this morning I want to spend a few minutes speaking to you from the subject, the man of sorrows. There are a lot of people today who are living around us who are suffering and feeling the many pains and disappointments which come with life. Many of these people are disconnected from God and therefore have little hope or little understanding about their agony. God in his infinite wisdom wanted to make sure that we as Christians would never have to feel that we are suffering by ourselves. Jesus came so that he could experience the sorrows of this world so that he could help us when we are suffering. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, the Bible says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, that is the devil, and to deliver them through fear, them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage for barely he took not on him the nature of angels but he took on him the seed of abraham wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like us brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to god to make reconciliation for the sins of the people for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted he is able to succor or to help those that are tempted. The Bible calls Jesus a man of sorrow, someone acquainted with grief. Think about that title, a man of sorrow. In Isaiah chapter 53, and thank you, Sister Clark, for reading it, we get a picture of Jesus. Isaiah chapter 53, the first Seven verses says, who have believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry land, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, 
for he was despised and esteemed not. Surely he hath borne our grief, carried our sorrows, yet we did not, uh, yet we esteem, yet we yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is bought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before shears. He is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. Here we see a picture, a tragic picture of a man who was born to die. Jesus came that he might ransom those who through sin were held bondage to the devil. But his death was not just some mundane sacrifice, but of equal importance was the way he lived his life. For you see, his life served as a model as a pattern of righteousness for us all. Christ had to experience all the experiences that we have so that he could provide us aid when we needed help. Christ's life was a litany of pain and sorrow. If you knew that your life was going to be a continuous stream of pain and sorrow, by definition, you become a man of sorrow. Christ came to put his hand in hot water so that when we put our hand in hot water, he could sympathize with us. There are four, type of sor four types of sorrows that I want to talk about today, which Jesus is infinitely familiar with. But these are the sorrows which we ourselves also suffer through. Let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 26. Matthew, chapter 26. I want to read verses 31 through 35. Matthew chapter 26, verses 31 through 35. The Bible says, Then Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men, shall be offended because of thee, yet I will never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. Likewise said all the other disciples, the first type of sorrow I want to talk to you about is relational disappointment. Jesus was infinitely familiar with relational disappointment. Jesus had 12 friends, people who he had given special powers and had given a special portion of his spirit with. These were the people who he was closest with, the people who had walked with him, the people who talked with him, the people who shared in his, strength, in his victories and shared in his defeat. But when the time came at the most important moment of his life, he tells them, all of y'all going to run and leave me. Peter boldly stepped forward and said, Jesus, I know you can't trust those other 11. They ain't no good. But me, I got your back. I'm with you. Jesus looked at him and said, man, Peter, I can't even trust you. Before the cock crows, you're going to already deny me three times. Jesus knew the pain of relational disappointment. Something I had never thought of before until I was putting this sermon together was in something that was said this morning in Sabbath school. It sort of comes together. In essence, what Peter was telling Jesus was he said, Jesus, you're lying. Jesus said, all of you are going to disappoint me. But Peter said, no, Jesus, you're lying. I'm not going to do it. 
We do the same thing, church. Jesus has told us what to do and what not to do. Jesus has told us where our temptations are. And yet we tell Jesus, I got it. I got this. I don't need your help. And we end up falling each time. See, we always say, I don't see anything wrong with this. I don't see anything wrong with that. God has told us, stay away from those things. But we look at it and we say, hey, I got it, Jesus. I can handle it. In other words, we tell Jesus, you're lying. You don't know me. And we end up falling for the thing that we shouldn't fall for. Jesus' best friends in the world, when the pressure came on, they ran from him. So Jesus is familiar with relational sorrow. I can tell you this just as sure as I'm standing here today, someone in your life, one of your friends, one of your neighbors, maybe it's like, it don't, I don't know, somebody's going to disappoint you. And you're going to deal with relational disappointment. It's all around us. Husbands disappoint wives. Wives disappoint husbands. Parents disappoint children. Children disappoint parents. Brothers disappoint sisters. Sisters disappoint brothers. Friends disappoint each other. All of us have relational disappointment. We think we're the only one going through this. He broke up with me. He left me. He lied on me. But let me tell you, Jesus knows what you're going through. Because he went through it. There's no security in friendships or in relationships. People are dealing with broken relationships today. If you think no one else knows what you're going through, just talk to Jesus. He can tell you. Peter was part of his inner circle. He was someone who Jesus placed great trust in. But when the pressure was on, Peter disappointed him. So if you're dealing with relational disappointment, the man of sorrow can help you because he's going through it himself. I have a friend whose girlfriend left him. He thought she was the one. Oh, he just thought she was the one. I mean, he thought the sun rose and set behind her. <laughs> but she broke his heart. And he was in a depression for a long time. And I told him, I said, man, you got to get over this thing. Something my uncle told me a long time ago. He said, Abel, girls are like trains. You miss one 15 minutes, another one be coming by. You have to learn that relationships are fraught with disappointment. And when you go through it, don't think you're the only one that's going through it. Jesus can sympathize with you. He can tell you, I had 12 of the best friends you could have. I gave them power. I gave them things that no other person had. Yet when the pressure was on, all of them walked away from me. But I was able to survive. I was able to move on. The only friend you can trust is Jesus. Jesus has promised I'm going to be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I have seven brothers and all of them I like. But Jesus said I'm going to be closer than even your brothers. That's the promise that Jesus gives. So if you're dealing with relational disappointment, Talk to Jesus about it. He can tell you about how relational disappointment hurts, but he can also tell you how to get over it. Because not long after, he saw Peter and he said, I ain't, I'm not mad at you, brother. You're still my disciple. You're still my friend. The second type of sorrow that Jesus was intimately familiar with was internal anger. Ellen White says that as Jesus grasped the tremendous task that was before him, as he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, the internal struggle was so intense that great drops of blood flowed from his head in the form of sweat. Are you dealing with an internal struggle today? 
a decision that's just weighing you down, something that you just can't seem to, to get a grasp on. No human being in all of history had to deal with the type of internal struggle that Jesus faced. And I can prove that. Have you ever seen anyone dealing with a problem that was so intense that as they thought about it, as they contemplated, blood began to flow from their pores like sweat? Jesus knew that he was dealing with internal, eternal consequences. He knows the pain of decision-making. No sane person wants to die. As Jesus suffered there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he got a first-hand experience with internal struggle. He said, Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. Something else you need to know. Ellen White says that Jesus would have died right there in the Garden of Gethsemane if he had not received help. Church, that's good news. That's good news. What that tells me is during the, my toughest periods, when I'm having my most intense struggle, God sends help to get me through. That's how God works. Those times when you sit back and you think, I don't know how I got through this. I'll tell you how you got through it. It's like the dream the man had of the footprints on the beach. When you only see one pair of footprints, that wasn't you walking. That was God carrying you. Amen. And if Jesus needed help, what do you think we need? And that's why Jesus could can sympathize with you. That's why Jesus can help you. Jesus can say, Father, I know what they're going through because I went through it. There are people in this church today who are struggling with decisions. Let me tell you, Jesus is here to help you. Someone is trying to figure out how I'm going to feed my family if I take Sabbaths off and lose my job. Someone is, wonder, someone is wondering, how will I ever overcome this sin? It's got me gripped. It's got a hold on me. Others are wondering, how am I going to make it now that I've lost my job? People are trying to figure out, how am I going to win the victory over the devil? Some people are dealing with the loss of loved ones. Everybody in here have some kind of internal struggle they're dealing with. And you don't know how you're going to make it, but let me tell you how you're going to make it. You're going to make it because you depend on Jesus. Jesus can take the problem to his father, and he can say, I know what they're going through. And I know they're not going to make it unless you help them, Father. Jesus understands the struggle, the sorrow of an internal struggle. You see, church, the things which helped Jesus face his trial was that he knew that God had a plan for his life. And even though he didn't understand the plan, he trusted the plan. Y'all too slow. <laughs> even though he didn't understand the plan, he trusted the planner. When Christians get in trouble, they want to scream out. They want to say the same thing Jesus said on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's no problem with that. But as Christians, we cannot linger in the valley of doubt. We must always be looking forward, looking toward the hill of hope. We should never be panicked as Christians. People panic when they don't have a plan. But God has a plan for your life. So you should never be panicking. The moment we understand that God has a plan, we can endure whatever struggles might come. Christians should never be panicking because they know no matter what the situation is, the planner has it all planned out. Whenever you're in a frightful place, you need to remember that God has a plan for your life. He is not, he didn't bring you this far to leave you. You may not always understand the plan. You may not always trust the plan. 
but you need to always trust the plan. Before you were born, God marked out everything in your life, and he knew what you were going to be dealing with. And he weighed it so that everything that you go through, God has already weighed it. And he will never put more weight on the bar than you can lift. That's his, that's his promise to you. I have a GPS in my car. And one day, one of my friends invited me to his house. And he lived in one of them strange areas with a lot of turns and twists and the whole nine yards. And so he gave me his address, but then he gave me the directions. And I said, well, I'm just putting my GPS. He said, don't do that. Take these directions. And so I put the directions in my GPS, and I went driving in my car. Finally, I got to a road where there was a fork in the road. And my GPS told me, you need to go right. But my friend's directions say, go left. So now I have a dilemma. GPS saying go right, friend's direction saying go left. But you know what? I trust my friend. So I went left. A few minutes, I saw him standing up there waving on his porch. If you trust the planner, you can trust the plan. And that's what we need to understand. When we go through trouble in life, trust the plan. God did not bring you there to leave you. He is going to get you through. If he brings you there, he's going to get you through. So trust God. When you really trust God, when you really, really, really trust God, you learn to trust God's plan for your life. See, when you're in God's plan, there's nothing that's going to stop your success. When you're in God's plan, no matter how messed up your life may be, it's a success in God's eye. Through God's plan, you can conquer any problem you have, solve any problem, endure any illness, go through whatever trials or tribulation you might have to go through if you just trust the plan. Let me assure you that if you trust the plan and follow God's plan, the devil cannot defeat you. All he can do is delay you. He, can, he may impede you, but he can't stop you. He may annoy you, but he can't block you. If you trust God's plan for your life, you will be successful. God's plan will always succeed but you have to follow God's plan for your life. The problem that we have is we have our own plan for our life, and we deviate. Jesus could go to Calvary because he knew that God had a plan. See, they had come up with this plan years before in heaven, and all he had to do was follow the plan. And when he followed the plan, we ended up on Sunday morning with him walking out the tomb. Now imagine if he didn't know the plan. Jesus had to follow the plan, trust the plan. You need to trust the plan. If you trust the plan, it will end up with you walking out the tomb saying, I'm a victor. Y'all kind of quiet today. <laughs> you know, I was, as I was looking at this thing, in the book of Matthew, they were talking about the things that Jesus had to deal with. They said they spit in his face. They buffeted him. They smote him. And then they said, prophesy. If you're Christ, prophesy. Tell us who did it. I was trying to figure out what kind of man could endure that. Because the Bible says he didn't open his mouth. I told y'all this, and I'm going to tell y'all one more time. When I was in eighth grade, this boy spit on me, and I'm still looking for him. <laughs> but Jesus endured it. I, it's just amazing. He never said a word. The third type of sorrow that Jesus is familiar with is physical pain. 
Is anyone dealing with physical pain today? Talk to Jesus. Are you going through some pain or some sickness that no one else seems to be able to understand? Tell Jesus about it. The Roman soldiers mercilessly beat Jesus and mocked him. They took a whip with nine strands and embedded in those strands of rope were pieces of bone, sharp rock, and other things, and they ripped the flesh off his back. Then after ripping the flesh off, they, off his back, they put a robe on him, multiplying the pain. They slapped him and kicked him. They beat him like he was a dog. All the while, they mocked him and questioned him. They even talked about his mama. I tell you, boy, Jesus was something else. I could have gotten through all those other things, but they did, if they had said your mama, y'all would have all been lost. <laughs> but he endured. He didn't say a word. He had full control even when people were talking about him, even as he was going through the pain of death. Even after they beat him and kicked him and spit on him and talked about his mama, then they murdered him. And instead of cursing him, he was yelling out, Father, forgive them. He was killed in the most brutal form of murder that man's sick mind can invent. I studied what the crucifixion was like. And it's not like, you know, we do the little pretty thing. It's not quite that pretty when you read about it. They nail your hands to a cross in your feet, but nailing your hands and feet to a cross doesn't kill you. What happens is, as you're up there, you can't, you're, you can't hold that until too long, and so you begin to sink, but then with your feet, you can't hold up with your feet, and so eventually, your body begins to convulse, and eventually, what happens is, your heart explodes. So when they say Jesus died of a broken heart, they're not playing. Jesus suffered pain like no one else ever suffered pain. The Romans couldn't even believe that he died so quickly. They had to break the other people's legs because they needed them dead before the Sabbath. Imagine that. <laughs> I need you dead for the Sabbath. Sabbath ends at 8.42. I need you dead by then. They killed Jesus and then ran home to keep the Sabbath. But Jesus understood their pain. Sometimes we go through pain and we think nobody else knows what we're going through. But let me tell you, Jesus understands. One of my friends used to answer my questions when I used to say, man, you got to do this or you got to do that, he would say, the only thing I got to do is die black and pay taxes. Well, I told him there's one other thing you got to do, my brother. You're going to have to have some pain sometime in your life. There is only one city I know that's free of pain, and it doesn't have a dress. It has headstones. If you want a life free of pain, you need to reserve a place in that city. But anybody else is going to have some pain, and pain is pain. And when you feel it, you have to learn to trust God because that's the only way you can do, endure it. We, we live in a world full of pain, a world full of sorrow. People are suffering from natural disasters, from sickness, the, the results of living in a doomed world. All around us are people in pain, and they cannot understand that pain unless they go to Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can understand our pain. I'm going to tell y'all, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock, I go through a torture session. <laughs> I have three ladies that grab my leg and just turn it and twist it and all kinds of stuff. And the sad thing is, I'm the youngest person in there. 
I'm the only person with a nice tan, but I'm the only person hollering. <laughs> and I am, oh! <laughs> and it's, it's just unbelievable. And I, sometimes I sit there, but I, you know, I'm the only one also who said, Lord Jesus, help me. <laughs> pain is not a respecter of people. Black people have pain. White people have pain. Good people have pain. Bad people have pain. Pain is part of everyone's life. And as long as you live in this earth, someday, somehow, you're going to have some pain. And you're going to think you're the only one experiencing it. But let me tell you, Jesus knows what you're going through. I'm running out of time. My last sorrow. The last sorrow that Jesus is familiar with is spiritual abandonment. You heard me right, spiritual abandonment. While suffering on the cross, Jesus cried out to his father in his native tongue. I was doing some research. On it. He went back to the Hebrew and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt abandoned by God? Have you ever fought or have you ever thought in your mind, God has forgotten about me. God doesn't know what I'm going through. Well, talk to Jesus. Because while on the cross, Jesus said, my God, why have you abandoned me? Church, God turned his back on his own son so that he can turn his face towards us. God walked away from his own son's suffering so that he can come and help us when we're suffering. When you're alone and feel that even God has abandoned you, you can go to Jesus. And Jesus can assure you, I'm a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I understand what you're going through. I know the pain you're going through. I was there. And because I was there, that's no excuse for you giving up. Because if I endured it, you can endure it. And the kind of endurance Jesus gives is not just endurance. He says, I'm going to help you. What does it mean, Jesus, I'm going to help you? It means that if your pain is 108%, Jesus says, I'll take the 100. I'm just going to let you have the 8%. Because I know you can take that. Our part in God's plan is always to trust the plan. When it seems like nobody else in the world cares about you, let me assure you, Jesus cares. The reason we are celebrating this period is because we're being reminded that God loved us so much that he gave us Jesus. And he didn't just give us Jesus. He made sure that Jesus had experienced everything that you could experience so that when you were down, so that when you were hurt, so that when you could not go on, he could carry you. I'm closing now. Even amid Christ's suffering, the Bible says that God was in man reconciling the world. God wants to introduce you to the man of sorrow. Whatever your sorrow may be, Jesus is the answer because he's the man of sorrow. As we prepare to celebrate Easter, let us not forget that Easter is not about the bunnies, not about the candies, not about the baskets. It's about the man of sorrow and the suffering he endured so that he could save us. Thank you.